bless what I was preparing for on other lessons. I guess he wants me to do this again, okay? So this will be uh, an important lesson. Like I said, this is one of those most important lessons that I want people to hear that I actually put it in an advanced discipleship lesson. Because I really believe this is not an amateur lesson. This is only for those who've been advanced, who've grown, okay? You might say, why don't you put it at the beginning? Because uh, you so-called advanced Christians don't know this lesson. So that's why I need to teach this lesson to you so-called advanced Bible believers. Always knowing too much, and then, you know, you think you're better, and then, Come on. you know, that's why you get a fallout in your church, and you have an attitude problem. So that's not good. So I hope that this lesson will be a blessing to the people, and that will be very eye-opening. All right. Now, I talked to you a lot about humility in my other video, uh, in my other lessons that I've done uh, with you. Uh, I appreciate the encouragement, uh, the feedback that I received, where it has been eye-opening and helpful to some of you. What I'm now going to do is something that... Uh, is very important. Like I told you, this is totally unorganized, so I'm just giving you everything from my own experience that the Lord dealt with me, okay? So we'll see how the Holy Spirit leads and then what kind of scriptures I'll turn to. So if everything that, if I, if it sounds like rambling on some things, uh, it could be a nugget, believe it or not, all right? So just keep an eye on that and write it down, and then I hope it'll be a blessing to you. Amen. Now I'm going to teach you on uh, one of the things that has been a problem for me, is how to be humble when the authority who is in charge of you is doing something wrong. All right? Or uh, the authority that's in charge of you, you think is doing wrong. Now, this is going to be a very important lesson. Now, in the previous lesson, we've learned that we have to be humble and submit to the leaders God put in our lives. Amen? Amen. I do not believe in being a rebel. One of the biggest problems with people who watch online stuff is you're a rebel, okay? Yeah. So if I hurt your feelings, I'm sorry. But there is that tendency in there. Now, obviously, I'm not saying everybody who watches us is a rebel. There are people who are just great uh, people, love the Lord, and they're the most humble people that I have ever met. But the tendency of an online mentality is you're your own man, you're your own woman, and no one's going to tell you what to do, okay? So I am not a believer in that one. God put authorita uh, authoritative figures in our lives so that we can be able to learn to submit. But now I'm going to talk about something where here are authority figures that the Lord put in our lives, leaders God put in our lives, and we find problems with them. So that has been one of the most, uh, this is very important. When, this is why this is an advanced lesson. Where you thought you learned humility at my previous lesson, then the Lord puts you at a different level. What do I mean by that? You thought you learned humility to, uh, and submit authority is one of them. But then the next level is what if that leader is wrong on something or does something very bad to you? Then what do you do? Especially, here's something important. If God's hand of blessing did not leave that person yet, it seems like God's still blessing that person. And in your heart, you're wondering the unfairness in your mind. And if you're not careful, rather than seeing the hand of God behind it, you might attribute as that person doing his or her own fleshly thing, which is why that leader got the success. That it's all done by sin or their fleshly ways. No, they could be following the will of God. A person who is so much in the wrong, too. That doesn't make sense, obviously, right? Right. So then, that's why this lesson will be very important for you to learn, all right? So, uh, my thing is that uh, I'm a Korean, and this has been a big problem, I think, with Korean people, all right? As a Korean mentality, we believe in honoring uh, the older people. Now, they're losing it, all right? It's horrible now, all right? So, what's this world coming into, you know, the liberalism crisis? But anyway, so we're a community mindset as well. Now, I come from that. So, uh, believe it or not, uh, being a troublemaker or a rebel rouser was uh, not my weakness uh, when I went to a Bible-believing church or to PBI, all right? When I saw a lot of these people who caused trouble or were rebel rousers or argumentative, I always despised them and looked down on them. I'm like, why can't you be loyal? 
you know, why, the, and then be a helper to the person in the ministry. So that was my mentality. But that became, listen, my weakness as well. Um, if you remember my preaching about uh, what will you do when Satan makes you suffer, right? What if Satan makes you suffer? The noble parts that you do for the Lord could become weaknesses as well. That's important to understand. The noble things you do for the Lord could also become your weaknesses. If there's one thing God knows about our flesh, is that our flesh doesn't like to change. All right, now that's something important that I want you to hear. All right, if any of what I say is a nugget, just write it, even if I don't write, write it, okay? Your flesh does not want to change. So here's the thing. Let's say your flesh is used to submitting, being loyal, obedient, being a blessing to people in the ministry. The Lord knows that your flesh gets comfortable with that now. So when your flesh, when your flesh gets so comfortable with that, then the Lord puts an uncomfortable scenario or suffering where it just hurts your flesh so badly. So if your flesh is so used to submitting to someone, then the, both the devil and the Lord will find your weakness right there. So your flesh is prone to doing that then. Submitting. Okay, what if that person you're submitting becomes an abusive person maybe now? What are you going to do? Wow. Right? So then, then it really troubles you. Now, there are a lot of people who don't come back to church anymore because they mention about they found corruption with their pastor. Yeah, come on. And they think that that's enough to throw away their Christianity. Well, they've got their wrong faith on someone. They should be putting their faith on Jesus Christ, not the pastor. Amen. Yeah. All right? right? I believe in loyalty. I believe in submission. I believe in obedience. I don't believe in being a rebel rouser. Amen. But that is a problem for people now. All right? Wow. Now, people who are rebel rousers online, they'll probably say amen to everything that I'm saying, and it's not a problem with you. <laughs> and then you got a flesh problem. Your flesh is used to being a rebel. So I don't know what's worse. Your flesh being used to being a rebel or your flesh being used to submitting to people. All right? I don't know who's better now who's watching. All right? So anyway, that should convict you. All right? But let's get back to the point. I'm dealing with now with people who have this problem with their flesh. It is a fleshly problem, I want you all to know. All right? If you're so used to submitting. The American mindset is not like that, I realize. Okay? We're too independent. Okay? We're too independent. Uh, but uh, from my roots, where I come from as a Korean, that is a problem to us. All right? Uh, you know, when I talk to some Kore uh, Koreans, especially from those who are from a Bible-believing background, that is very troubling to them. And then I'll have to try to explain them as best as I could how you got to put your faith in God, not in people. So that is so important. Okay. So uh, I hope that this will be a help to you because uh, it's, but it's not just Koreans, all right? I know the American mentality is to be independent and a rebel. But there are Americans whose flesh could be prone to submission as well. Amen. So here's a good example. You grew up in a Bible-believing church. You're, you're used to and trained to being obedient, humble, because you come from a Bible-believing mother and father. And then you come from a Bible-believing pastor, Bible-believing family, all right? But this does happen. It's rare, okay? Compared to other churches, this is rare, but it does happen. And you might be one of those people. What if it turns out that your pastor does something wrong, and then your family does something wrong? Then what are you going to do? Get in a crisis mode? Stress out? Especially if Bible-believing pastors or Bible-believing families talk bad about you. What are you going to do? Throw away your Christianity and cry after that? <clears throat> See, so that's the problem right here. Look, uh, here's the thing, guys. You won't uh, have a problem with your family criticizing you. But what if Gene Kim criticized you? How would you feel? Mm, wow. mm. That would probably deeply hurt you, right? Yeah. Why? Because of the trust you invested in me. So this is such an important lesson that I want people to learn and to hear, all right? I'm not trying to get you to become a rebel rouser against me, all right? I, if people have been in our church for a while, you know that's not our church, all right? Or so we think, all right? If you, think, if you don't think so, then you need to go back to lesson one, all right, <laughs> on humility. But this is lesson two that I want you to graduate and learn. This is your next level of spirituality. I know my weakness, and I'm prone. Look, I am scared of me. If there's one person I'm scared of the most, it's 
you know, obviously I fear the Lord, but I am scared of myself. That's one of the top people that I fear the most. I'm capable to do anything, all right? I'm no better than you, all right? I don't know what I might do, but God forbid it's something I might, I might do something bad, right? Yeah. So when such a time comes, this is going to be important because it did hit me, okay? It did hit me. And what happens is you'll get right here. And it did hit me too, okay? You don't want to end up here, and I hope that this teaching will help you. All right, so let's first talk about the position. Position, all right? Now, if it comes to doctrine, all right, let me make this uh, disclaimer. That way we can make sure we understand this, all right? If it's a doctrine and sin that's very plain about uh, the pastor or the parent or your husband or a leader that God puts in your life, you are not to follow them, all right? Otherwise, you're disobeying God, all right? What, if the husband tells you, you know, to take heroin, you're going to do heroin? See? So when it comes to a sin or a doctrine that's very plain, all right, and that's very major, you do not obey, you do not follow that, okay? Uh, actually, you shouldn't follow it at all. That's anything wrong doctrine or any, uh, or any sin. But then comes, what about speaking out against them, right? Because obviously, you know, if husband is beating up the wife in the home, then obviously you want to kind of point that out that that is actually wrong. That is actually a sin. Okay. So what do you do up to what point do you criticize, right? Mm -hmm. So then up to what point you criticize is if it's a major thing, or I'm not writing this down because that's not part of the lesson, believe it or not, mm -hmm. right? I didn't get to the lesson yet. But if it's a major thing that ruins the testimony <laughs> that's uh, important to address, then you should do it, all right? But if the pastor teaches some kind of doctrine that's very minor, all right, and then it's not a big deal, you got to let it slide, all right? Pa pastor could be in a bad mood too, all right? Could be overtly critical of people, all right? That's not where you speak out against him in front of the whole church. Yeah. That's very unwise, okay? So uh, why? Because we don't do that to each other either, all right? Yeah. So what do we do? We don't, uh, if everybody sins in the church. Amen. So even pastor don't really do that to the member. We only address something when it's a major heresy or a major sin. Then we'll criticize, we'll rebuke that. Any wrong doctrine or any sin, you don't follow, all right? So there are two levels right here. Any wrong doctrine or any sin, you don't follow them, you don't obey them. A sin or a heresy that's so major, then that's, that is important to address for testimony's sake, then you should, all right? So I'm not talking about that one now, all right? So I'm not talking about any of these things, but these should be common sense. And if they weren't common sense to you, then they should be common sense now, Amen. and you should remember them in the future, all right? But in fellowship and separation, in my basic doctrine teaching on that, that was kind of covered. Yeah. In my basic doctrine teaching on judging others, that was covered. So that's beginner's discipleship. So if some of you, this is new stuff, then we have to go back to basics rather than finding the 13th toenail of the Antichrist <laughs> and going backwards with our dispensations and then pretend that we know it all, okay? Whereas you'd be so surprised how many advanced people forget the basics. All right, but enough harping on that. I gotta get to this one. All right, so forget the doctrine and sin. All right, if it's not something that's... Uh, Doctrine and sin, that's a major that you can criticize, all right? But it's something that they do, all right, that you feel is wrong, all right? You feel is wrong. We're not talking about something major here, all right? That you feel what they do is wrong, you believe it, all right? So listen, you almost believe it to be sin. You almost believe it to be sin. Before you open your mouth, okay, listen, all right? Before you open your mouth, you need to look at these two things, the testimony and evidence, all right? Now, this is why you Bible believers still have a gossip problem. Yep. You know what? What you see, listen, all right? What you see, you believe to be what they're doing is wrong, all right? So then the tendency now is to speak bad about them or to rebuke that person or spread the gospel to the person or even doing tattletale, all right? So here's the thing, is that what is your actual evidence? Now, if the only ones who would probably understand this are people who've been more involved in the ministry with me. Mm -hmm. 
and they would bring up the issue and what would I do? What's the actual evidence? Yep. If right. our RBB connect, I want to see actual posts. That's right. That way I can see certain words. You might say, why is that? Because that way the testimony where everyone sees it, they'll see the actual evidence that they can't deny. Do you understand that? But I know that person's spirit was so mean and stuff like that. Look, spirit is not something that you can pull up as evidence to people. You have to do something that's clear as day, that's strong evidence, that way people can believe you. Okay? So you have, it's so important that you can't go by anything that you think to be wrong. All right? Good. You have to have actual evidence. What are the actual cases that happen? All right? It's like a court of law, okay? You can't give, everybody can't give their feelings or their opinions or what they thought or what they saw. They want to see actual testimony, eyewitness testimony, of what actually was said, what actually happened, what actions they specifically did. So it's so important to be as specific as possible. So here's the thing. You have to interrogate yourself. That's important, all right? You have to interrogate yourself and then you have to pull up the spe with specifics. Interrogate yourself with specifics. Okay, what is my actual evidence here, right? Interrogate yourself, what do I have? Just somebody who said just one sentence? You know, do you think then the testimony, everybody will believe just from that one little sentence, right? So you have to realize that uh, or a certain word that was said. Or that person looked at me that way, you know? See, so that's not going to work. So you have to have evidence and testimony. Now, not just evidence, what could actually help is this too, is number of witnesses. Go to 1 Timothy. That's why 1 Timothy has a reason here. The Bible said about an elder, you don't rebuke an elder unless... So keep your hand at 1 Peter 5, obviously, because we didn't really read that, all right? Put your hand here and then go to 1 Timothy. Go to the book of 1 Timothy, and then we're going to look at chapter 5, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Notice right here that it's so important that a person, in verse 19, an elder, all right? So there's a leader in the ministry, all right? Look at 1 Timothy 5, 19. Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before what? Two, Two or, three or three witnesses. The number of witnesses become more powerful. Why? And I don't mean you and your husband. And I don't mean you, your husband, and your kids, okay? I'm talking about separate eyewitness testimony. Because in a court of law, they can see that as basically psychological manipulation or psychological tendencies and agreement with each other. Okay, so it's so important you got to have a separate eyewitness testimony. So when you do that, it becomes more believable. It becomes more believable. That is extremely important. That's going to be very helpful for you. When you do this then you're going to keep your mouth closed more often, all right? Now, what if the person is truly in the wrong? Now, 80% of the time, if you're in a Bible-believing church and a Bible-believing pastor, for example, you're 80% of the time wrong. Why? Because I've dealt with too many of these situations. Mm -hmm. But you will come across once, at least once, or twice in your life, that 20%. Like, 100 times it don't happen. Problem is yourself. But when you hit that one or two times, what are you going to do then? Mm -hmm. And it does happen. you got 80 years in your life that you're living, and you're telling me once or twice it's not going to happen. See, so this is very important, all right? Because you're going to come across that once or twice. So when you come across situations like this, what do you do? Think about this, see, your testimony and then the evidence. Now, the next thing is this. The next thing is, will be very helpful. Your bottom's off. Uh, yes, sir. I see that. Thank you. Thank you. The next thing you want to do is, obviously, you want to surrender it to prayer and God. Surrender to prayer 
and God. Now, obviously, when you get like a husband beating you up, I mean, that's so plain and that's so uh, evident and that's too easy. But then when you get something where it's a Bible-believing pastor, for example, and then he is friends with other Bible-believing pastors, and they're all people that the members look up to, and then you're the only one on. who catches the problem, then what are you going to do, right? 80% of the time, yeah, I, I know that it's going uh, to be people's fault, but that can happen. And when that happens, what are you going to do about it, Okay. So it's so important to understand what can I do. You have to surrender to prayer and God. And sometimes uh, it's going to be hands off then, right? Then what are you going to do? Oh, man, I just feel so bad. And no, there's uh, an important character that you should learn from. His name is King Saul. Mm -hmm. Now, King Saul, he was anointed by God. When he's anointed by God, you know what David had the sense of? Not touching him. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. He had that sense. All right. Now, David had every right to slit his throat and he had every chance to do so. But he didn't. He tried to show to everybody because see testimony, right? Yeah. yeah. That's so important. You try to show to everybody, hey, I'm not a rebel rouser. That's good. You know, Amen. see, I never put my hand on him. I uh, pray for him. If you don't believe me that he prays for him or he has a heart for him, you didn't read 2 Samuel 1. Yeah. He right. mourned not just for Jonathan, but for Saul. Saul. Yep. That's right. All right? So it's so important to understand that God's hand was upon King Saul, whether we like it or not. But then here's the thing. What was going on is that David, he was in the bottom. All right? Now, if you read 1 Samuel... David was never on top, all right? There were times that he got successes, and then people looked up to him and stuff like that. But then what happens is, and jealousy kicked in with this guy. Yeah. And that's usually the problem with people who think that they've been walking with Jesus longer than a new believer. Yeah. Wow. wow. All right? That's, that's why I, I hit on humility very hard. Preach. I don't care if you preach well how long your walk with Jesus Christ is, all right? You're all prone to pride. It's and I, I will slam right. that till the day I die. I will teach humility Amen. a thousand times if I have to. All right? So uh, this is so important for all of you to understand. If I prefer, if you're going, if I'm going to teach you everything that I know, all the secrets of life, all the secrets of spiritual power, and I know you're going to mess that up, all right, I prefer you didn't learn a single thing from me at that time. Wow. Amen. All right. Oh, thank God for Bible-believing truth. Thank you so much. I learned so much stuff, and I prefer you never did then. Wow. All right? If you're going to come out that way. All right? King Saul had everything. He had everything from the Lord. But because of his flesh, because of his pride, he lost it all. Now, David, he was always pressed down no matter how up the Lord put him in. All right? King Saul always persecuted David. All right, so then how is David still elevated? Why did people look up to him? So then what happened was this. Even though people criticized David still, and they would uh, go along with Saul's program, the thing is this. One is, David's testimony was key. Because he maintained a good testimony, the eyes of the public eventually received him. They saw who was right. But it didn't go until Saul died. Do you realize that? They didn't do it until Saul died. What if that, uh, what if that leader is always looked up and nicely talked about and people never recognize the problem until the day he dies? Yeah, sometimes that's what's going to take. Yeah. Well. All right? That's what's going to sometimes take. Well, that ain't fair and stuff like that. No, you got to realize this, all right? One is... God does. God said it repented the Lord. He made Saul king. Yeah. That does happen. The Lord can repent, but why does he keep him on the throne? You thought about that? He's supposed to continue to fulfill God's plan. Amen. Why couldn't you switch David? Why couldn't you switch with David? Because God had to... So I'm going to kind of go back and forth. God had to keep teaching David. David could not become king until he went to the cave. 
when God saw David's testimony in the cave and how he submitted to authority, the Lord's like, I can trust this guy. He's not going to abuse power. He's going, he's going, uh, he's going to take it seriously. That's why he made him king. God has to, you got to realize this, a lot of times we want to blame a leader, but you got to put it on God. All right, you got to put it on God and make him test and try you. But then the problem then is then we can get bitter at God, right? Yep. So when that bitterness comes out against God, you got to realize this. You have to understand that the reason why it's not God's fault is because we live in a world of unfairness to begin with. It's not, uh, you think it's only the Christian leader that uh, gets away with their problems? Or Mom. too many unsaved leaders here get away with their problems. Yeah. Yeah. All right? You think I'm happy for the one who's in the White House right now. You think I'm happy about our current governor. You think I'm happy. There's plenty of evil people who still get away with stuff. All right? So you have to understand this, is that you have to surrender them to the Lord's hand. Why? David had no idea what was going on in Saul's life. Saul, he lived a life full of hell. Yeah. How do we know that? Because we just read the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. But there was no Bible for David to read about Saul's life, what was going on with him. Yeah. Wow. That's right? good. So, right. you don't know, so you have to, it's so important. What did the Bible say of Romans 12? You can go over there if you want to and then read the final three verses. But Romans 12 is, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith yeah. the Lord. Amen. Here's another thing. Hebrews 12, God says, I have to chastise my child, correct? Yes. All right, so you have to understand this. It's total surrender to God, all right? When you have this surrender to God, then what happens is the Lord is dealing with that person. So then that leader, you have no idea what the Lord's doing in his life to chastise him or how the Lord's dealing with him. Well, I don't see that, Pastor. I see them still blessed. Well, did you read Psalm? <laughs> I mean, there's plenty of those passages. David mourns about those enemies of his who seem to be still blessed and successful. So the thing is this, is that what we perceive as success, you don't know what they're going on deep down inside their hearts and their minds. Yeah. There are plenty of rich people who seem to have it made that they're successful, yeah. but you hear them where they committed suicide that's later right, on. Yeah, that's right. right? Yeah. So you don't know the turmoil that's going on in their lives, all right? right? right. So you have to completely surrender to God and believe, believe God is currently dealing with them. Amen. That's so important to understand, and that God will get them, okay? Amen. That's important to understand. Now, uh, believing in that, you also have to believe so that you don't get bitter at God, is you have to believe in his good care for you. More so than judgment against the evildoer. Let me repeat that again. To get rid of bitterness, you have to look more at how God is testing you and blessing you from that. God blessing you more than punishing your enemy or what you perceive to be your enemy, all right? So I don't know who might be, all right? I mean, it's possible, it's possible. I do not believe children rebelling their parents, but some of them have just awful parents. And they could be Bible-believing parents too, all right? Yeah, amen, all right? Some Bible-believing parents need to hear that, all right? So it's so important to understand that rather than seeking about seeking that person getting right or being punished, you have to look more at uh, God blessing you. Amen. How is God blessing uh, your life? Uh, if the Lord is testing you, putting you through a trial, but then blessings come out of that, that should be more prized and preferred than for you to see God judging the leader. More than you seeing the leader repent. Why? I think at the judgment seat of Christ, you prefer yourself to be in check than the other one. Yeah, that's Amen. good. All right? You, wouldn't, uh, how many, I, I mean, uh, you don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you would like to be the one who does well at the judgment seat of Christ? <laughs> of course, everybody. Yeah. If there was one person you pick, who would it be? My pastor. No, I'd be me, stupid. I'd pick me, all right? All right? 
Don't be stupid, man, all right? I want to be the one who gets it right, who gets my clothes unscathed at the judgment seat of Christ. So, uh, oh, well, I want to see my leader repenting. I want to see God judging that my leader. No, the, the judgment seat of Christ will do more than that. All right? So if you don't see it down here on this earth, the, the judgment seat of Christ will do more than that. And trust me, you're, gonna, you're all going to be saying, man, thank God, man, that I got myself right. Yep. Rather than wasting my whole life seeking that other person to get right. Mm. You're wasting a whole life of vengeance just trying to get even with the person or getting that person right with God rather than yourself all this time. Good teaching. So if there's something more valued is how God's blessing you or trying you. Blessing and trying you. That is very true. If that's what you prefer, listen, look at what you prefer, all right? I'm underlining this, okay? What do you prefer? The, the leader getting right, repenting, or the leader being punished, or you, you. being tried and blessed by God? If you only have one choice, that will change your whole life, all right? It, it will help you immensely, all right? I've had people that, you know, uh, with the problem with position is when you uh, look up at them too much, all right? And then you've seen God mightily use their lives, all right? I saw King Saul, how he was unapologetic and he divided that oxen and got the, uh, the Jews together. I saw how Saul, how humble he was, that he didn't want to become king. I saw Saul, how God mightily used him to conquer those Philistines. And everybody talked about Saul. Everybody looked up at Saul and always looked up at him. And then what happens is when Saul throws that javelin at you, you get bitter and mad. Yep. You don't want to be that person. You don't want to be that person. So what's so important to understand is don't ele don't uh, don't exalt man too much. That's that's an important thing. All right. Mm -hmm. So that we can get rid of bitterness. I think over here would be better. All right. Don't exalt man too much. So that's very important. When you um, so it's not like you're worshiping him. You know. But then you're going to realize when the person you respect or honor does you bad, the Lord's going to sometimes open your eyes. You really put that person up a little bit too high, didn't you? Yeah. Don't you think that you got to really let the person go and really look at me this time? That's what's going to happen at times, all right? So it's so important to do that. So don't exalt man too much. Otherwise, you will be let down. Uh, there's... One thing I really hate, all right? I really hate it when this happens. But what I hate, all right, and this happened to me, is when I look at people in the church that I've trained or, you know, uh, certain people or preachers I looked up to who changed my life, whenever I say something really good about them, like a really big credit to them too, I don't know why, maybe the Lord's doing this or, or to teach me, I don't know, but they always mess up on something. And I'm like, why? I'm like, why? So then the Lord had to open my eyes and then had to teach me, hey, so, you know, what if it turns out that uh, they let you down? I mean, are you going to shake up your faith or because your feet have always been planted in me all this time child That's god good. says to me That's you're not going to be shaken all right there are people who question their bible believing walk with god how can you question your own bible believing walk when you look at somebody else's walk who's not right with god yeah. that doesn't make sense the Bible-believing life is because of your free choice. You know what God showed you to be true, and that's why you chose that. All right? So it's always you and God. It's never, don't let anybody else dictate your life. That's so important. Okay. Uh, let's see right over here. So you have to look at your position. All right? David still submitted to Saul. You notice that, right? He still submitted to Saul, and he let the Lord take care of him. That's what you should be doing too. All right? That's what you should be doing, too. There are times that you just want to call out something or criticize something or rebuke, but my advice is this, all right, and this is very helpful. You always have to look at your testimony, all right? 
not yeah. just evidence itself, but also your testimony. It will be very life-changing to you if you think that way, all right? If you make the decision that I cannot speak out, I'm just going to have the Lord deal with them, then you surrender it to prayer and God, all right? Prayer and God. The next thing is this. This is, uh, this is not really advisable to some people, but it is actually good advice, all right? If you want to get, if you're going to become bitter, the best thing for you to do is to separate distance. You might say, why is that? Because you hang around that bad influence for so long from that leader of yours, then it's going to make you more bitter. Do you understand? Sometimes a person is never going to change, and the Lord's going to let that happen. And when that happens, all right, oh, Lord, I don't know why, you know, you're making my life worse. It's because you, you're staying there. The best thing is to leave, all right? Look, it does happen, all right? I wish everybody got along, and there is no church split, and everybody's good, and we can all serve God. But you know what the problem with Bible believers are? We all think we're right. Yep. Members think they're right. Pastors think they're right. And when we have that kind of mentality, we never get along, okay? That's good. All Preach right? that, brother. Right. Why? Because here's the problem, is that because Bible believers are trained to not let the world persuade them out of their faith. Mm. That's a noble deed, a sacrificial deed, something you're willing to die on a hill upon, all right? But remember, noble deeds could become weaknesses. That's a problem. So because of everybody's spiritual convictions, if you want to call it, it became something that the devil has used where it caused hurt to many people. There are people, okay, look, I, I've been to tons of Bible-believing churches, and it does happen, all right? And people don't have to sit down and be quiet and pretend that, and be a hypocrite, all right? You all know this happens. There are plenty of Bible believers I met who left their Bible-believing church and pastor to go to a different Bible-believing church and pastor. Mm -hmm. That always happens, all right? How many times per year? Oh, I would say probably a thousand, you know, Bible believers per year. Because Bible believers are so small. <laughs> I think numbers would be higher than that, but I, I dare say a thousand. Thousand per year. Thousand per year, right? If there are that many Bible believers, all right? So, but that's how high the rate is. Why? That always happens because they saw something wrong with the leader or the church over there. Now, a good percentage of the time is because of themselves they're the problem, yeah. all right? Yeah. I do know that, all right? But there are, look, I, uh, there are some people that it genuinely happened, and Bible believers will admit this too. They've met these people. They're friends, all right? They're family members. They had good reasons to leave that other church and pastor, and they know it, all right? So what do they do? They just don't talk about it. They don't mention names. You might say, why is that? Because that's called surrender to prayer and God. And that's also watching your testimony. All right? Mm -hmm. And then they'll hear somebody brag about some name of a Bible-believing pastor in church. And I met these other pastors and other members. When they mention about some pastor and the name, and then they uh, say, oh, what a great guy that person is. I look at the other person who's been hurt by that pastor, and they just keep their mouth closed, and they don't say anything. Amen. Praise All God. Right? If you've been in the ministry a long time, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Amen, sister. All right. Yeah. That's, I, I didn't mention the person's name. <laughs> so it does happen. All right. Why? Because when you meet so many Bible-believing pastors and churches and make friends, yeah. you are going to bump into those situations. Yep. Yeah. Right. You just put on a smile. Yeah, just put on a smile. Why? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We just love each other. That's it. All right? So that's the thing is that uh, how can I put up with that one? So then all you have to do, uh, this is a problem with many people. We put Christians on such a high pedestal for some weird reason, but we don't put them in the same level as other humans. If we do that, maybe that will be more eye-opening. Mm. So... What if we were to put our spiritual family at the same level with our lost family members? Ooh. Wow. Now, don't they talk bad about you? Mm. Don't they let you down? Haven't they betrayed you on something? Haven't they? Yeah. All right, but does that mean that um, 
you're gonna spread evil and post something online and make a whole video on so That's and so and you, you're That's so good. immature, all right? No, people don't do that, all right? Nowadays, it's so bad, some teenagers might do that, all right? Yeah. <laughs> on Instagram and stuff like that, all right? It's horrible, you don't wanna be that person. It's so important to understand that even with our lost family members and friends, if we're able to just keep our mouths closed, and if we're in a family meeting, and they all talk good about this family member that you know that he, <laughs> he or she is not that good, if they only knew it, but you just smile, you just try to get along, That's right. Right, and you love. If you can do that with lost family members, you can do that with your saved brothers and sisters right. too. Right. Why? It's called Amen. human nature. Human nature, all right? Well, I can't do that because they're Christian and, oh, see, that's your problem. You're, uh, you're exalting them again, see? Go back to your advanced lesson. You know why you're bit bitter? You put them on a pedestal. That's good. You exalted them, all right? You cannot do that, all right? So you have to, what do you do in, when you're lost fa uh, family members and friends? You try to distance. You don't call it out. You don't really clearly separate. But you'll do some distance, and if at times you can bail out or separate, then you would do that, right? Yep. See, so if we can learn to do that in common sense scenarios with lost family members and friends, you can do that with uh, your brethren too, right? Mm -hmm. Brethren um, in the church and the pastor, where it turned out that they did, truly did something wrong, and you, and you really believe it deep down inside your heart when you pray to the Lord and you can see the evidence for yourself, then uh, what you're going to do is you're going to leave then. All right? If you have to, then leave. All right? Look, this does happen. All right? And if you're, look, don't, Bible believers might be shocked and might be scared about it. No, this happens to a lot of people, and you know it too if you've been to Bible-believing churches. All right? They just pretend it doesn't exist, but it does. So when that happens, all you can do is if that person leaves, then, then you got to leave it between them and the Lord. No one knows who's right and wrong. If you choose to leave, and that's between you and God, all right? That's between you and God. That's all I can say. So that's why it's so important that there's this distance or separation. Distance or separation. When there's a distance and separation, what do you do? You also keep in mind your testimony, right? So then... There are people who might say, well, it turned out that I left because of a health problem, so I don't go anymore. Which is true, but that's not probably the real reason. Probably the real reason is because somebody, some people in that church with the pastor hurt them really deeply. There are other people who might say, well, you know, it turned out I went to this other Bible-believing pastor in church because it, you know, they had more kids and it fit with my kids, so that's the reason why I went over there. But that could be true. But probably they're covering up another reason because the other pastor in church did blah, blah, blah. All right? This does happen. All right? If you go to family meetings, they do that too. Oh, I can't go because I have a final exam coming up. Mm -hmm. or I can't go to the reunion that day. But then you go, no, it's because aunt so-and-so <laughs> is over there. And that stupid cousin of mine, why is... So that's what happens. All right? Look, that's what happens is you're looking at your testimony with your family, aren't you? Yeah. Why are you so worried about looking good in front of your family, but you're not concerned about your appearance as a Christian being good in, the, in your Christian family? Oh, that's good, brother. Amen. Why embarrass your testimony for all the world to see? Do you want people to see how Bible believers really fight with each other? Do you do that with other families? You want to see how divisive and messed up your home is? Nobody does. All right? So that's why it's so important to understand with the distance and separation, you keep in mind as well, this goes back to position here, right? Position. Wow. So you have to also look at your testimony, all right? Testimony is so key when you do this, when you do the distance and separation. Now, this is one of those taboo lessons, all right? The lessons that people don't want to talk about, but I believe it should be taught, okay? Okay. Because this is your, uh, why is this tied to humility, see? Why is this an advanced lesson? Because bitterness will turn to pride. That's right. All right, what happens is this. You see so much wrong in that leader. Listen, this is so important for you, all right? What's going to happen is that thinking in your head, 
is I'm right. I've been wronged. So then you make it an agenda to go all jihad mode and getting vengeance. See that? That's a horrible testimony that you don't want to show. All right? It turns to pride. Pride and vengeance unconsciously to these people. You do not want to get over there, all right? Because in your mind, you're like, I'm right, I've been wrong, I'm right, I've been wrong. Then what happens is this. What happens then is you start to judge other people who might share similar traits, mm -hmm. like the other leader who wronged you, and then you're going to be judging them and think you're better than them. And then if you're not careful, you think that everybody should follow your spirituality. Wow. And when you do that, that's pride. Yeah. Do you understand? This is so important to learn. I probably said important like a thousand times in this yeah, lesson. It's good, but brother. the reason why I'm stressing this so much is because it does happen. I've been through it because I've been raised by Bible believers. I've seen it with my friends. I've seen it with other Bible believing pastors too, who left their pastors and became pastors themselves. And they're right for starting the new church and leaving. <laughs> and then here are pastors who get along with all the other pastors. Hey, what's this? It's, you know, you can hear a pin drop, right? Why is this important? Because when you come across this in life, it's going to mess up your mind. And bitterness will always be hiding inside your heart. You do not want that in your life. So what's so important in your life is that it's so important to understand that bitterness will turn into pride. You cannot do that. So when you get over here, you always have to go back to, when you think about these points, then the pride can simmer down, all right? If you just keep applying these principles, then what will happen is the pride will simmer down. Keep an eye on yourself, all right? Keep an eye on this one. Are you here? If you're here, then you're going to hit pride, all right? Always keep an eye on this. Always keep an eye on this guy. Because it could be more blurry than you think. It's not as clear as you think. What's going to happen then is when you keep thinking, I'm right, I've been wrong, then you're going to stick on that. And then when more of the details are shown, you're going to find some parts where you were wrong about. And you're enemy, if you want to call it, was right about. Then can you swallow the humble pie and say, I'm wrong? No, you won't do that. Why? Because if you got married to someone, you do that too. When you get married, it's sometimes not really clear black and white. Sometimes it's a mixture of the husband's faults and the wife's faults. But they just don't want to say that they were wrong. Why? Because then the other person will judge that person. See, I was right about this. Okay. And then you don't want to eat that humble pie. So then you're going to get back to over here that I'm right. I've been wrong. Now, why are people like, oh, this is oh, 10 subjects? No, this is called reality. And you know this is true. Yeah. Yeah. It's that mixture. It's always a mixture when you have a problem, uh, when there's fights. So even with the leader who wronged you, that's why it's so important before you, if, if it's so clear for you to find that other's weaknesses, it's so important to look at yours first. Yeah. It's so important to do that. And that's why the 80% who leave the churches, all right, they're going to find out, find out they were not that 20% all this time. They were that 80% who left. Yeah. All right? So uh, remember, the 80% are those who tend to be rebel rousers, who don't really understand the leaders, all right? And they should submit, all right? So that's that 80%. But no, you're that 20%. I'm right, I've been wronged, and stuff like that. But what happens is this, is that instead of looking at the clearness of the wrong of the leader, if you look at your own wrong, all right, look through that blur and then see your wrong parts, then what happens is this, you're going to catch that. When you catch that wrong thing, 
then it's going to be more clear on what your feelings, what your next actions should be. But if you don't catch that wrong thing, you're going to remain in that trapped feeling. That trapped feeling of always looking at the wrong of that guy, rather than seeing the right in that guy. That could be the reason why God's still using the leader. No, wow. Why? Because that leader still has more capability than you. So that's where we come down to understanding here, all right? In understanding, there are several things what's going to happen here. You got to think about the leader. Uh, they're basically a different generation or a different culture. That's the reason why they do things, they do things. They say things, they say things. You don't know their life story. And because of that, their mentality, their conviction will be different from you. And they're going to say or do things that you really feel or even believe is wrong. When you come to that, then what's going to happen is that the Lord's going to show you when you get to their culture, listen, when you get to their culture, or when you get up to their age, you're going to start to understand now, this is the best advice. You know how to get rid of that bitterness and then work on your humility and even listening to the leader? Instead of, uh, uh, this is the best thing, instead of looking at all the wrong that the leader is doing, try to look at the life and the details of the leader, why they do that. If you do that more, an understanding grows and the right reactions come out. If you did that in your marriage, how much would you get along, you think? <laughs> so you have to always look uh, at the details of what that person's going through. I mean, that helped me many times. Like, you know, when uh, what helped me with my wife is I have to know where she grew up from, how she always lived her life, and then always saw patterns how she did and the details. By doing, when I stop and think about that, I calm down much more. Amen. And then I'm able to communicate more effectively. Amen. One time with my wife, when I tried to show her, uh, try to make her understand me, I just told her to just look at a list of what I do, and I begged her, just, just look at that, and then just a couple minutes, and that helped her part too. We have to understand that when we have this kind of moment of experience, an experiential moment like that, where we concentrate on the details of that person's pain, their concerns, what they're going through, that simmers your anger against them a lot, and your understanding of them increases. Amen. But you're too lost in the exper experiential moment of your hurt. See that? Mm. The experiential moment must change. You cannot be stuck on your pain. you got to get out of that and try to experience that person's shoes. When that happens, an understanding of that person grows. Amen. And what could turn out is, you may not be that 20% who rightfully left. You may have been that 80% who wrongfully left. So that's going to happen. It will incredibly help you. Even if you turn out to be the, this is a good one. Even if you turn out to be the 20% who is right for leaving, what's going to happen is you may not even be the 80% who will leave, who are wrong to leave. You may be that 20% who's right, and then when you have that understanding, you're not going to speak much evil on that person or bitter, mm -hmm. but more so a prayer and maybe even empathy or pity. Mm. That's what's going to happen. So remember, what is the two greatest commandments? My pain, my pain, myself, I've been wrong. No, 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 no. Loving God and loving others. Your neighbor. Your neighbor. Yes, you have to think about others yeah. Amen. all the time. You're not above them. That's They're right. above you. That's Did right. you hear what I said? Yeah. You're not above them. Your feelings are not above their feelings. Their feelings are above yours. When you do that, it will incredibly change your life. Well, that ain't fair and that ain't fair. No, no, no. What's going to happen is this. When you do that, then remember, the Lord is the one who does fair and what's unfair, right? Yep. Let the Lord handle them. 
Remember, who wants to be the one who comes out good at the judgment seat of Christ? Do you want to be the one straightened out, or do you want the other person to be straightened out at the judgment seat of Christ? Why that other person, man? If you're angry at that person, you want them to get even at the judgment seat of Christ, wouldn't you, anyway? <laughs> so then, uh, why not think about yourself here? Me Amen. getting right with God. Amen. It's that simple. Besides, wouldn't you want to be the one who makes God proud the most, who yeah. God rewards the most, who God said you are the most mature one out of this bitter or bad scenario the most? Wouldn't you like to be the name that was called upon that? That's important to think about. Also, another thing. What's going to happen is when you get to their age or to their background, you're going to see a bit of you. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, you ever saw kids, you know, they get upset at their parents, you know? Oh, why do you do that? Why do you do that? And then when you grow up to be a parent, you repeat yep. Yep. what your parent does yep. to you. You ever hate it when your spouse tells you, why are you like your dad, your mom? Oh, that kid's you. So you're like, no, I'm not. You know, but they're like, oh, no, I see that. You know? <laughs> right? Don't, don't you hate that? Everyone hates that, right? But see, that's the thing. Why? Because you reach their age. Yeah, that's good. You reach their, maybe their culture or their experience. When you get there, you will understand why they did that. And you, even though they're wrong, and yeah, they're definitely wrong, you let it slide. Why? Because you've become understanding why they did that. Yeah. That's what's going to happen. All right, you're upset at the pastor. Have you been through the struggles of what that pastor went through? They don't tell you all their struggles. Yeah. Have you been into their situation, what kind of hurt or pain they went through? Have you seen the kind of... Uh, uh, problems that they experienced with members in their church. So then that's the reason why they probably were treating you the same way as well. They were afraid you were like one of those other members who are causing problems. You have to think about that. And if you, don't, if you say, well, they're still wrong, they're still wrong, one day, this is important, God's going to put you in their shoe. When God puts you in their shoe, you're going to let some things slide. Yep. But here's the problem. This is the problem with pride. You ready for this? If you keep this feeling in you all this time, remember this, when the same things happen to you and you see a bit of yourself following and you kind of understand, instead of an understanding, you still maintain the pride. I'm right, I've been wrong. Even though you still act like that other person who wronged you. Was that too deep or did you understand what I just said right there? See? That's the thing, is that if you're not careful of this, okay, this humility lesson, then what's going to happen is then you're going to repeat their same problem while at the same time still blaming that person for the problem. Oh, isn't that what we're living in our lost world to get today with spoiled generations? Look, uh, I don't care if you are 60, 70, 80, or something like that. We're already all a spoiled generation. Come on. What we always like to do is get upset at our older generation, our parents, but then when we tend to repeat the same mistakes, we stay stuck in our pride in repeating their same mistakes while at the same time getting mad at that older generation. You know what that's called? Hypocrite. Yep. That's Good. hypocrisy right there. Total hypocrisy. So you have to have this because you're going to be guilty of two sins, pride and hypocrisy. You don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. All right. So then what's going to happen is you're going to see a bit of you, and then it's like everything that I said. It's going to be the same feeling. You're going to have the same feelings like them. Why they did that wrong to you, so to speak. Because it's so easy to do it unconsciously, see? It's so easy to follow their same things unconsciously. Because you, your flesh feels the same way, and it's prone to do that unconsciously. Like a defect, without you knowing, without you realizing it. Unless somebody else sees it and tells you and you're humble enough to see it for yourself and to uh, correct it. Here's the thing. What if we were, okay, if you refuse to see this part, what if we were to video record evidence, right? What if we were to video record your eye movements, the tone of your voice, everything you did, the decisions you made, the way you said, and compare that with the leader 
that did the same thing to you? Wouldn't there be a shame? Pride's not going to stick in there once you see that. It's shame. Wow. And you're going to feel like throwing up. That's why it's important to correct yourself now. Do you understand? That's good. To humble now. You know why I'm telling you this? Because at the judgment seat of Christ, that's exactly what's going to happen. God judges you for every thought, every action, every word you said, the Bible says. When he shows how you're acting the same way as that leader who wronged you, what are you going to do? Well, That's why this is a very valuable lesson to keep in mind. The last thing I'll say is this, okay? Believe it or not, pass the time. So let me wrap it up. Why it's so important to do this, it teaches you to be humble, actually. What does that mean right there? What that means is how it teaches you to be humble is that when you practice all these things, your pride gets lowered definitely. Now, your pride gets lowered definitely. And what happens is when you treat others, you're not going to be repeating them with the same mistakes as the leader who wronged you. You're not going to repeat their mistakes. When you see your weakness and their weakness, and then you surrender the other person's weakness to the Lord, and your weakness, you get it right with God, what happens is this. Then you're so humbled. When you're so humbled, you don't dare do that to other people or think you're better than anyone or dictate everybody's spirituality by your measure. Another important... Another important thing with how this keeps you humble is that you realize it's truly all God. That's what you really come down to at the end. You thought that you knew what that meant. Truly all God, truly all God. No, you don't really know what that means until we really hit the weak parts of your flesh more. more much more surrender to God comes out after that. And then you realize that it's truly you have to leave it up to God. It's not about me being right, right? Me being justified. It's all about God getting the glory. That's right. So when you think about that, then you're going to be understanding and let God keep using Saul for his glory. Wow. Even though you think you should, he shouldn't. Amen. And you're going to be understanding why God is trying you still. Amen. Because so that he can get glory from your life where you can clean up some things and be used for his glory. Amen. That's what's going to happen immensely in your life when you truly all God. And another thing is this. Another thing is you might also realize that you're no better than the person who wronged you. Right, no better. Be believe it or not, that's what's going to happen. You're no better than the person who wronged you. You don't believe me now, but uh, you will one day. You're teaching. It will teach, uh, this is the next lesson in humility that I hope will be truly life-changing to you. And it's the next level. It's the next level of humility. I pray that you'll practice this in your life. The biggest mistake many people make is this, is that when there's advice or a command from a leader, and then it really bothers you, and then you pray to the Lord, and the Lord shows you something different to follow, who are you going to follow? But this is pastor so-and-so it don't matter this is my mom and dad who really don't matter this is my husband no it don't matter you have to follow what the lord showed you if what the lord showed you you must do differently you have to do differently then who are you going to follow see that's why you have to keep that in mind such a crossroads happened in my life and when I, when I came to that crossroads, all right, I had probably maybe four of these or five of these existential crises or something like that, if you want to call it, all right? It really drained me out, all right? I would call every pastor around the world. I would uh, talk to my parents like 50 times, you know, stuff like that. And then I realized I have to let that all go and just pray to the Lord, all right? When I did that, I got peace after that. Amen. I got peace after that, and God blessed me after that. Amen. What the blessings I have now, 
I probably could have gotten it earlier if I knew this lesson a long time ago. Amen. That's true. So I hope you will follow that. Now notice from my life as well, even though I had to make independent decisions myself, rather than what other people would say, I have to weigh what they say, if it would be, if there's anything good or any truth, bits of it, not the whole thing, but just bits of it, that would match with my different conviction. If it did, that helped me even further. And also, I was able to protect my testimony, and I don't have to talk bad about them, see? Amen. So this will be very life-changing to you. I hope it will help you. Maybe, you know, maybe not. You know, maybe it is a tense subject, but um, this is so important for people to reach that level of humility. It happens to everybody, yeah. all right? It happens to everybody. So whether a pastor, whether a parent, or whether a husband, or some leadership position God puts in your life, you want to come out where it comes out nice and peaceful, and where God's work is still intact, rather than divisive, ugly, bitter, and so much pain and hurt. All right? You don't want to end up like that. All right, Father, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers, became eye-opening, and may we uh, serve you with all of our might and truly leave everything to your hands. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.